Um, we have a list uh, that we give to our salesmen. Sometimes salesmen fill it out, sometimes they're too busy to fill it out, but it helps the estimator a lot as far as qualifying what type of a, an estimate we're going to do. What type of foundation? Is it a slab? Is it a basement? If it is a basement, height of basement walls, uh, what type of floor system? Is it eye joists? Is it floor trusses? Dimensional lumber. Um, so all of this information on the sheet that we have, the more that they can have filled out, means the estimator is spending more time estimating instead of making phone calls and trying to get questions answered on stuff that you should have had out of the gate. But sometimes it's tough to get salesmen to do that, and so an estimator spends a lot of his time making phone calls, making sure that uh, he has the accurate information to, to make the quote uh, what it needs to be. Deadline, everybody that drops off a blueprint, you know they want it right now. And it just, it takes time to, to make it accurate. And, but it's, it's a catch-22. Uh, I tell the estimators, it's kind of like basketball. If you make the winning shot, but it's after the buzzer, it doesn't count. And so it doesn't matter how good an estimate is, if it's too late, if it's after the bid date, uh, well, we just spent however long, you know, some, some estimates take a week, two weeks, just to go through all the information, especially on multifamily. Houses are different, but then, you know, when somebody drops off a blueprint and you tell them, you know, you're two, three weeks, uh, that you're gonna be with that print, it's not two, three weeks on that plan, it's getting it in the works so that an estimator can look at it. And sometimes it's hard to get the, the builders and the contractors to work with that and understand that, you know, it's a process. Homeowners, they want it right away. Owners of buildings, they want it right away. And so it's, it, it is crucial. It, 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 there's a fine line on getting it quick, but if you give a, a fast estimate, and it doesn't have accurate information, it's not going to do anybody any good. Uh, I've experienced in the past where, you know, you give an estimate to a builder, and maybe you won the bid because they, they wanted the cheapest guy. Well, maybe there was material that got missed or wrong material, and so through the process of building, because the estimate missed material incorrect because of time, you have a, a, now a contractor who's very upset that he's buying more material than he thought he was going to. So deadline, you know, it, it's tough. Everybody wants everything now. Um, when the project will begin, uh, that's probably information that's more helpful to the pricing side of things. The lumber market is all over the place. Uh, we just went through a few months ago where lumber prices were going crazy, going up. They came back down, they kind of flattened out for a little bit, but now they're taking off again. <clears throat> and I know that we're talking about estimates, but at the end of the day, uh, it does come down to price because th that's what everybody's kind of looking at. Um, so uh, on, the, on the estimate side, it's, and I probably go more towards, because of my background being in framing, uh, there's a salesman that works for us that does some of his own estimating. And he leans more towards what the builder wants, what the, what the contractor wants. I lean more towards what the framer wants because I know what it's like to put the man hours on. Uh, for instance, take OSB, wall sheeting. If it, uh, it's a nine foot wall and you send out eight foot sheets, that means he's got a, a splice at eight foot that he's got to put blocking all the way around the project. And we, we do, we have a couple builders that that's what they want, they want eight foot sheets because per foot, it's, it's less expensive than nine foot. But you have to think about all the blocks and all the time that it takes the framer, and of course, you know, the, the contractors, they, they want their framers to move, they, they want the house done. So in looking at that, I would estimate nine foot sheets instead of eight foot sheets if it's nine foot wall. Uh, and, and if they're sheeting the rim, which in my opinion they should, then it's gonna be 10 foot sheets. So now you're jumping from an eight foot sheet to a 10 foot sheet because you're covering your rim joist, you're covering a nine foot wall. And so these are things that I think about when I do estimates, and, and I do estimates. I've got a blueprint on my desk right now that I worked on this morning before we came here. Um, and so I see it through, I mean, 
you know, there's a happy medium. You got to make everybody happy. You got to, especially since we're selling to the contractor, we got to please them. But if you can get people educated and get them to see the whole picture, I think it, it, it helps. And I think it starts in estimating as far as, are you sure this is the road you want to go? Uh, and sometimes, you know, you have contractors that they, they might not know. And so when you can educate people and get them aware of why is it that I would want to go with a 10 foot sheet instead of an eight foot sheet, yeah, it might be more expensive, but you're going to be spending the money on two by six for blocking that's going to go around, the, you know, the whole perimeter of the house, uh, possibly even garage walls. So those are different things that uh, I guess we, we look at on that. I'm going to turn it over to Wayne as far as communicating with GC. As the title said, you know, what we're trying to do is discuss the effective communication between you and your end user. What's important to know is who that end user is. Are you bidding for, are you doing an open bid for a general contractor? Does the GC negotiate it? Does he know what he's, what he's building? Is it his to, to, to do? Uh, within that, we can talk with project managers, architects, et cetera. Uh, I had a discussion with some guys this morning, you know, talking about RFIs, you know. We have to effectively know what our plans are, structurally, architecturally, uh, before we can ask the questions we need to know about. Uh, you know, what uh, material being used, what product they want, et cetera. One person once told me that it's better to tell them what they need as opposed to ask them what they want. You know, lead them, and this is from a GC, lead them down the road that we want them to go into as opposed to let them decide something that's not affordable for them to be able to build. But, you know, architects, you know, like to put out 50% plans, 75% plans, 95% plans. They're not really quite 100% plans, and I think we've all seen that. Uh, missing details, missing information, et cetera. So we, as an estimator, we need to be able to understand, you know, fill in those blanks, ask the questions to them, and that way we can get effective answers back for what we need. Uh, my point of view is I always want to keep my GC in the loop as far as questions that way he hears what I'm asking. So many times I've been asked, you know, to be a designer, to be an architect, to be an engineer, to be a consultant. And I will remind them, I don't have an AIA, I don't have PE, I don't have AHC, or I don't have CBO behind my name. I'm not an architect, I'm not a professional engineer, I'm not a, especially a co-consultant. Unfortunately, though, I will be the most dangerous person you will ever meet because sometimes I think I know more than what I should. So sometimes I have to tell myself to put my brakes on and say, back up a little bit. I don't want to lead them too far because I have to worry about liabilities for my company. Because if I tell somebody this is what they should do and it doesn't work, then it comes back to me. So, Knowing how to write, you know, RFIs to a contractor, you know, to ask them questions, you know, detailed plan pages, details, uh, et cetera. That way they know where you're asking. You know, help an architect out by uh, pointing out to them exactly what page it's on, what details on, what you're asking. You know, I've gone as far as taking and, and, and copying part of the plan onto my RFI and showing exactly where the detail is. You know, how many times do they put a three-ply header in a two-by-four wall? You have to point out to them, it doesn't work sometimes. Uh, architects and engineers are great on communicating because architects are great about drawing a lot of things. They have unlimited uh, ability to dream up all these buildings, but then they leave it to the engineer to be able to, you know, put the framing in there. You know, I always say that the, the structural is the skeleton and the architect is the aesthetics. You know, if we can all make it look good, but it, all ha it still has to be able to stand up at the end. So as far as carpentry, you know, is it a single floor, two floor, three floor? 
uh, got to think not necessarily two-dimensional, but three-dimensional. Not look across the plan, but also look up two. You know, do things stack well, et cetera. You know, are your bearing points in the right locations? Do they all lay out? Uh, especially when it comes to hardware. You know, sometimes they'll put a column cap there and not necessarily knowing that the, that the beam is not above the column. Or architecturally, they haven't drawn it that way. So we deal, a lot of times, what we do as far as RFIs, the architect will turn into addendums. You know, they'll, especially on an open bid, you know, they will take all the questions, pull them together, and issue an addendum, you know, for a plan, modification, you know, redraws, et cetera. So uh, when I ask questions like today, you know, I have three guys working on a project right now, you know, when I ask questions, they send their questions to me, I send them back, reformat them, copy to them, the questions to them, that way they heard what I asked, and I sent them to the architect and the, and, and the GC. So that way we're not kind of doubling up on our tasks as far as where they are. So really, it sort of comes back to effective, effective communication between all industry parties. Uh, change orders, you know, this is more like after the fact, but you know, sometimes when you ask a question, you know, you get redraws, you get uh, things that change. So uh, an ASI will be issued or a change order issued, so it's a matter of how you incorporate that in, into your plans. Uh, again, you know, it, as Sean stated, sometimes you have to know your end user is. You know, I've even gone as far as asking a GC if this is a negotiated job, has he hired, already hired his framework? You know, knowing how he wants to build or what product he wants to use for certain materials. You know, does he want to use solid saw lumber for stair jacks? Does he want to use LBL for stair jacks? Does he want to use LSL for stair jacks? You know, door trimmers. You know, is he going to come out of, out of pre-cut studs? Is he going to come out of, out of random length lumber? You know, knowing what they want to use will make it better and effective for you to be able to create an estimate. You know, you're not going in the end changing things to meet the needs of who, who, who your user is. Uh, helps you as far as being able to uh, effectively ship that material as well. You know, you get a big, draw, a big plan, but are they going to build it in phases? You know, what building comes first, uh, etc. So, uh, a lot of questions to be asked, a lot of information that needs to be gathered, you know, before, during construction, during bid stage, uh, that will effectively give you better estimates, make your costs look good, because uh, you're, you're meeting the needs of that end user. So, communicate, you know, don't let your GC make you become somebody who you're not. You know, know where your skill level lies, know what capabilities are, you know, they don't like to hear the, to hear the term, that's not my job, I can't get it done, you know, but if we all work together, we all get to that, it, that, that common goal of being able to get that job built, you know. So it, it basically becomes a team effort. Uh, during and after, as I, as I said, you know, Knowing who the framer is. Uh, sometimes you got to go out to the job site. You got to go out and meet with the uh, superintendents. First thing I always add, that I will always ask somebody is, plans look good, but is that actually how they're going to build the project? You know, just because they put this material in this area, is that actually what the GC is going to use? Is that actually what the framer is going to use? So. Uh, Knowing what it is uh, will help you uh, eliminate the problems down the road. You know, as you work through a project, you know, see how they're doing it. You know, are they actually putting, you know, uh, how they built ladder headers? You know, are they using out of scrap? You know, are they cutting it down? Uh, so you can you can modify estimates on the run based upon how projects start by knowing how it's progressing along. Don't just assume that, you know, you set up material, everything's perfect out there, just because you haven't heard anything back from it. You 
you know, ask them questions. How, how's it going? How is their material usage? You know, that's one thing you can't control with framer to framer is how they control their waste, how they control and usage of mature material. You know, you can take an estimate off, but when it comes to that waste factor that you try to incorporate there, every bit of it's different as far as how, how it works. You know, I can tell the framer, yeah, I got a thousand feet of wall, but that don't mean he's gonna use a thousand feet of plate. He might use 1,100 feet of plate, 1,200 feet of plate. All comes down to, you know, are they all 14 foot plate, eight foot plate? You know, what's the length of the wall? What's the, what, what's the effective use of material that you have out there uh, to be used? So knowing how, you know, your framer and most material shipped out there. Hey, I want all 16 footers. Well, you know, that's great and fine dandy 14s, but then, you know, that's not cost effective. That's not how we bid it to the GC. You know, just because you want it that way, you know, that, that, you know, we need to have a little discussion here. You know, uh, is he gonna, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, use a blended material versus pre-cut material. Uh, obviously 92 and 5 base, 104 and 5 base wood studs cost a lot more, a lot more <coughs> than, you know, random material, you know. Most of your trimmer seven footers you come out of 14, you know, so effective use of, of, of that material. So, uh, you know, just being knowledgeable, communicating, you know, understanding, uh, you know, works out for everybody in the long run and gets you to that end point, so. Most of my background is, is houses. I did starter homes when I was framing houses all the way up through million dollar homes that I framed. And so when I took the position that I'm in now, and e even when I ran the component plant, there's a big difference between single family and multifamily. Even from a framer's point of view, I, I thought I knew it all when I was a framer and then I get into multifamily stuff and even doing an estimate, I, there's times I've lost. And uh, so that's where me and Wayne are different. His, uh, expertise is in the multifamily and mine's in, in single family. How I do an estimate, and I, and I hope this is being a help to you, how I do an estimate is how I framed a house. The only thing that I would do different, like the set of plans that's on my desk that I worked on this morning, um, I have to go through the, and think about the people that, you know, like windows. I, I'm going to have to get pricing on windows. So the first thing that I do instead of just starting on the lumber that I'm going to be selling is put a takeoff together for the window guy so I can get that email to him so he has time so that when I'm done, oh yeah, I need to get the windows to the uh, window provider. Uh, and it's, it's something that I've, I've done myself of not thinking about, you know, I'll do windows at the lat, well then I gotta wait a couple days to get a price back. So what I did this morning is, first starting off with a set of plans, I went through, got all the windows and I made a list of those and I emailed that off to uh, window providers and then I, I go through an estimate just like I framed a house. I, I start at the bottom, whatever it is. If it's a slab, then I start with the treated plate and uh, nuts and washers and seal plate or seal sealer and, and work my way up through the house. If it's a basement, I start with the basement walls. Um, if it's just a walkout wall, I, I do that first. If it has interior walls inside the basement, and since I'm down there, it, it's, I guess for me, I make a list of what I want to do and check it off so that I'm not missing things. Um, I'm kind of old school on, on how I do some of my estimating, get made fun of a little bit, but I get it done. And uh, so I'll do the whole basement and then I'll do uh, the, the floor system, um, whether it be eye joists or, or trusses or dimensional lumber, and I just work my way up through. Um, and I have systems of things that I put together as far as for the floor system, that's going to be uh, whatever they're using for floor joists. Um, I put the subfloor adhesive in there, I put the subfloor. And then once I get all that done, now I'm on, on the first floor, and I work up from that. I start with my wall plate, and uh, on some of it I use a scale, on some of it I use a wheel. It just, I go back and forth on, on different things that I like to do, some things that you're counting. Um, On multifamily, this is something that I, that I thought about while Wayne was talking. There's things that you have to estimate that aren't on the plans. And I hadn't estimated them, forgot about it, didn't think about it. 
and it wasn't on the plans, but the, the uh, contractor needed it, and we had an owner that was not too happy because the price was higher than what we gave him for a, a quote. He didn't think about, it was a, a four truss system, and he didn't think about all the two by fours and two by sixes bracing through those. Uh, he didn't think about the safety rail that you have to build around. And when you're talking a, a three and four story building, it adds up quickly. And so there's communication there too, of talking to, if you can, the framer on how you're gonna do it. And are you gonna take the bracing off of your first floor once you don't need it there anymore, and use that for bracing? through your four truss system? It, are you gonna be able to use that for your second floor? And on, on this particular building that I'm talking about, the framer left his, uh, all of his bracing up, and he sheeted the walls while they were, I believe, on the ground and stood it up. But he left all that bracing up, which I understand it went through his windows, but that was a lot of two by four that we didn't have accounted for. And we had an owner that was angry. Now at the end, he had a bunch of two by fours that had nails in it, and I let the, the owner and the, the framer discuss what they were about that. But there's things that you, they're not on the plans that you don't see that you need to think about because if you don't, somebody's gonna be upset. And I, I had to deal with some heated conversations uh, just because you know, it wasn't on print. But you have to think about it. And estimator learned, estimator learned a, a very, pricey lesson, uh, we, we, we shared the, the problem with the, the owner and, and, and cured it. And we have something that we're just starting on that it, everybody's uh, at Century right now is pulling their hair out. Uh, Wayne talked about it a little bit this morning, or just a little bit ago, and I'll go into it a little bit further. It, we have contractors that, I don't understand how people want to build the building before the plans are done. But that's the day and age we live in. And they want solid pricing that they're gonna hold you to before the plans are done. And so we're, I'm trying to work with them and be creative in coming up with a way. Now, I'm fortunate because I, not to puff his head up too much because I'll have to deflate, deflate it later, but I have an estimator over here that is very talented. And so I can use what he has as far as his expertise to accomplish some of what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm trying to give, now it's, it's contractors that we have history with and we have files that we can pull and history that we can go back and look at, but they want a pre, I mean, we're, we're talking 50% plans and they want a price that I know they're gonna hold me to. Well, how do I, I can say, well, you know, I can't do that. Well, then they're just going to go to another lumberyard, so I can't do that. So I've got to come up with a way, and we're working on doing it, and it's just going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just going to be, at least at first, contractors that we do have a relationship with to know like buildings. In, in architects, yeah, I, I, you know, every building's different these days. I mean, even on multifamily stuff, it's amazing how much different they are and the days of easy are over. I mean, even starter homes, you know, we got to have a chopped up roof with, you know, 30 hips and valleys on it uh, just to, you know, make it curb appeal, I guess. Um, and so we have to accommodate that. And so we're being very careful in a, we're doing our first one. And I'm comfortable with where our numbers came in, but it's a lot of educated guessing. And it's dangerous ground, and we've tried to make that very clear to the contractor because what the contractor's going to do is he's going to go to the owner with the numbers that we give him, and then he's really going to hold our feet to the fire on, well, this is what you said. Well, yeah, but that was 50% plans, and everything's changed, and we have a little bit further now, we're up to, I think, 95 or let's say it's 95%, more like 75% plans. And so it's Knowing history and having history that you can pull is helping us with it because contractors want it now and they want to hold you to it. And it's tough to give an estimate on something that you don't know what they want. They expect us to do it. And so we're doing our best with that to, to come up with a way. Right now I'm only going to be able to do it for, for contractors that we have a history unless they can show me you know, what they used. It's great when somebody gives you a takeoff. 
But that doesn't happen very often. They want us to do it. Um, but those are some of the things that I guess, uh, I hope this is a help to you on my background being from framing. That's, I estimate a house just like I framed it. And I, I tell my estimators, you gotta have a checklist. Because once you're done and we send that estimate out and it becomes a quote, it's tough to go back and say, oh, I forgot this. And so that's gonna add $20,000 to the, the quote. They're not real cool with that, and usually they're gonna go somewhere else. So it's, it's, you know, a lot of times in life, it's the simple things. Having a list, making sure you go through it, being thorough, educating yourself the best that you can. You know, I guess everything that I do in my life, I, I, I was fortunate when I framed. Started framing when I was 18, and I ended up getting to work with what, I'm from Nebraska, and what I consider to be the, the best framer in Nebraska, put a lot of knowledge in my head. And as I got older and learned a, bit, a little bit more about life, I found that, in, and I don't, I don't care what the area is, find the people that are good at what they do. And if that's what you're wanting to learn, that's the people you need to learn from. And so often, especially with, you, and I don't know that we have your estimators in here, but young people that think they know everything, and I've got a guy that's working for us that he's 50, he's older than that. And he thinks he knows everything. And it's like you can't get it in his head. If you have the philosophy, and I, and I do, I, I know I don't know everything. So it's easy for me to go to people that know more. It's easy. I'm Wayne's boss. But it's easy for me to go to Wayne and ask Wayne questions. Because I know Wayne knows more than I do. And I, I guess the biggest thing of, of anything you do in your life, find somebody that's good. The company that I worked at before uh, Century, I was so lucky with the people that I got to work with. Uh, one of them, he, he's been in the industry for over 35 years, and uh, we got to spend a lot of time together. He, he combed me through the sales and, and becoming a salesman, but I learned so much from that guy, just all of the knowledge that he has, and I guess that's what I do even in management. I look at people that are successful, and I talk to them, How do you, what do you do here? I had to deal with some problems this morning that were not a whole lot of fun. And I've got people that I call and say, hey, what do you do when somebody comes to your office and just flips out and loses it? And you got to get through your day and you got a whole bunch of stuff on your desk that you weren't planning on, this being one of them. And, you know, sometimes you just, you don't know, you don't have the answer. So I recommend finding somebody that does. There's a lot of good people that maybe they've got gray hair and we write them off because they don't go as fast and talking to them maybe just takes too much time. But man, that's where I've gotten some of my best information is from people that are a little older than I am that might have some gray hair, but they knew what they were talking about and being willing to listen. I'm gonna let Wayne finish it up. Common estimating mistakes. When I first started Century Building Solutions, the first